Welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast and show. I am your host, Elizabeth Upton, and as a former executive, I have seen it all. Our conversations are aimed at inspiring new ways that you can redesign your business and your life so that you can create more time, freedom, and power than you ever thought possible. If you are a highly driven business professional ranging from I have an idea to an emerging entrepreneur to a CEO who's ready to expand your team, or even if you are an employee who works for one, this show is definitely for you. Join us as we discuss strategies and tips and hacks that will help you to mind your own business, all while not taking ourselves too seriously. There's a little bit of all things business in here designed to simplify and set your life up for success from operations, marketing, sales, finance, and mindset to self-care. All of my guests have made an impact in my life and hopefully they'll do the same for you. If you love to learn and are ready to level up, you're in the right place. Welcome to the show. Hello and welcome to the Mind Your Own Business podcast. I am so excited to welcome this guest today. He is an entrepreneur. He's an angel investor. He's a social scientist, the founder of Authenticated Ventures, also a recovering label executive from Columbia Records back in the 90s during the golden era. And oh, just for fun, he's also a DJ on the side and a damn good one at that, if I might add. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. James Andrews, welcome to the show. Yes, Elizabeth, super excited to be here. Super um, interested in where we're going with this conversation and, and I'm open to any questions. Right on. Well, it's an honor to meet you. You know, we're really getting to drop in and I've, I've done a lot of kind of investigating, if you will, and looking at what you've done. And there are so many things that are inspiring because you've gone from senior roles at record labels to fashion brands, to tech startups. You've worked on advertising agencies, venture capital. You've been building and scaling your own businesses and you've had two successful exits so, you know, it's like, what don't you do, James? <laughs> I don't do crossword puzzles. I haven't become a spin teacher at SoulCycle yet. Uh, yeah, there's some still some things, Sesame Street, there's still some things left on the, on the bucket things. list. Yeah, exactly. Well, I know you said in one of your notes that your mom still doesn't know exactly what it is that you do and i was thinking maybe she could watch the myob podcast and she could like actually understand you after today you know what we're gonna do that (laughs) it's actually it's funny i don't think i've ever sent my mom any of my interviews so um she i used to appear on cnn and she'd see me there so i think she probably thinks i still do social media marketing or something i I think most of my family thinks that, that i i'm still like helping people understand twitter but uh but yeah, I, I only really get along with people whose whose mothers don't know what they do for a living. It's kind of those are those are mi gente. So. We can say hi to mom, and yes. you know, you never know. We, we might crack the code. We might yeah. not. Great, it, you right. know, it's a good bar to set, right? She, she knows it's all working out. Kids aren't hungry. You know, folks is going to Paris. Still got you know the white picket fronts and a dog and an ocean view. So life is good. Yeah. And you're, and you have, um, you're a girl dad, right? So Mm, yes, Uh, uh, that's pretty amazing. I love being a girl dad. I love, uh, being able to inspire, you know, my legacy through, uh, a a badass 19 year old female who's a freshman at Chapman university and, uh, just, you know, a wicked vinyl record collector, uh, purveyor of great music and producers. Uh, yeah, she's, uh, I, I often say that I have to think like a 19 year old girl to be successful in what I do. And I have to be raising one. So it's a, an honor. I've heard you say that. And I was really intrigued. I was like, wow, I've never heard someone say it or put it the way that you have. And what is it about thinking like a 19 year old girl that creates the level of like understanding or feminine, um, sacred feminine wisdom, like what is it in there? Because that's fascinating to me. I think it's a a wonderful age of discovery. Um, I think there's something about 
that I learned uh, through a study I heard on NPR one time about risk taking, uh, the difference between risk taking between boys and girls. And, and so it's really important for girls to take risks. Um, and so um, I, I want to always like channel that to my daughter. Um, and I just think 19 year old girls, um, just in general, uh, come at uh, this moment that we're in in the creator economy through a slightly different curatorial POV. Um, they are, you know, when my daughter was younger, it was like every sleepover was like a movie edited and iMovie, you know, out to her friends' posts. Um, I think there's something about the curation of Gen Z and 19 year olds different than, uh, you know, your generation, probably. I'm not sure exactly where you think. Definitely. But, um, yes. but, but they're, they're, they think differently about the world. They think about activism differently. They call out bullshit easier. So yeah, mm -hmm. I think just 19 year old girls are like, badass. You know, yeah. And I think that, you know, it's important uh, to understand all of my qualities of, of, of being a man, you know, and, and I think understanding uh, adolescent girlhood is, is, is an interesting place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a way to challenge yourself too, to put yourself yeah. outside of exactly. the, the box. Yeah. Cause know? I'm not and a 19 year old girl and I'm never been a girl. <laughs> never, Just so. to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> never been a girl. Well, I know yeah. In, in one of your interviews on um, Rebel Radio, you were talking about how like being one thing in your life like would make you anxious. Like if someone were to categorize you as one thing and, and I would say that like you have successfully, like I don't think anybody could ever in their lifetime categorize you as one thing. Yeah. Um, so you've achieved that. So congratulations. <laughs> Ooh, that's why my mom doesn't know what to do for a living because she can't really <laughs> talk about the y YMCA. How's your son? I, I, I don't know. What does he do? I'm not really sure, you know. <laughs> uh, I think it also comes from this place of, uh, I grew up with a super woke white mom. I have a woke white mother story. Uh, I don't know how many of you have a woke white mom story, but mine is a woke white mom story. And my mom was born in Italy to a German Jew um, and an Italian mother. And uh, my father's from the Bahamas. So I am both Ashkenazi Jew and slavery. And I happily sit in the middle of this sort of identity you know, mashup. I'm like a mixtape, right? Of all of these cultures. I grew up in the Bay Area, so I know where to get the good lumpia. You know, I know I speak Spanish. I know, you know, Korean food. You know, uh, I, I know the difference between a Tongan and a Samoan or you get beat up. So like, I'm really like the product of this sort of, you know, 70s, 80s Bay Area, um, which, you know, allowed me to be kind of fluid in my identity and just be culturally aware and and to be you know wealthy in my cultural acuity um and uh so it also transfers over to like w what i do for a living like i actually didn't care what people like the black people were like ah you're a white mom you're not black enough or the white people were like ah they, you know so i've always like, been able to flow through uh, and, and I'm original third culture kid, right? There's this whole phenomenon that I've been playing with, with these, the, a lot of my friends in the Middle East who call themselves third culture kids. And so I'm like an OG third culture kid, you know, fully this, fully this and embracing kind of where I am in the moment. And, um, you know, that fluidity and that ability is, is what has helped me as a global executive. It helps me have identity with people um, around the world. So when I go to to Rio, you know, I mean, I know the culture of Rio. I know Wednesday's Feshwada. I know that I went to the favela and went to the ballet funk and I know their culture because I was up close and personal with it. When I go to Dubai and Abu Dhabi and uh, Qatar, like I smoke shisha with Emiratis, you know what I mean? So like, I'm very fluid in my identity. I'm also ethnically ambiguous. So Ethiopians run up on me and they, you know, they, they say, uh, you know, are are you um uh uh are you are you one of us? No, I'm not. I'm not one of you. But I, I think I'm one of you. I appreciate you. I see myself in you, um. And so I've uh, so I appreciate just kind of the the fluidity and and whether people think I'm Habasha or think I'm Emirati or think I'm from Goa in India or think I'm from Dominican Republic. I I've instead of um being like no, I'm American. You know, I kind of embraced. Uh, other in a way that makes me very comfortable in any room. I think that's too one of the big things that that like magnetized me to connecting with you because um, you're a bridge builder, just mm -hmm. just like I am, and I've I've had the 
incredible honor to travel all over the world and to live all over the world and to be in, you know, the Yucatan Peninsula and filming documentaries and traveling Egypt and going to Guatemala and being um, to all these sacred sites and indigenous wisdom. So I'm really fascinated by ancient culture. I'm really fascinated by being a bridge for ancient wisdom and what it is that is our roots and being able to have that be a major part of how we live our lives and yeah. that influence on our perspective and what it is that that we're here to do right because it's yeah. like the human story our lives like what is it that we're here to create while we're alive because it's it is fleeting and and that connection of that the the tapestry of all of the cultures like i fully jump in and appreciate the same way because it's it's influenced my life and um and taught me yeah i remember i was like in italy and there was this beautiful older woman and she was shaking out her laundry and she was up and I looked up and she was on her balcony and she's hanging her laundry and I just I had this moment where I flashed to wow like this woman is now hanging her laundry on this balcony in this moment while I'm here while all these other things across the world are happening mm -hmm. and really seeing the interconnectedness of all the things that we do in our lives and it was this moment of just like getting the connection mm -hmm. to all of these things and, and also understanding how much is happening outside mm -hmm. of our awareness. Totally. That's like, oh yeah. Like I could be in, you know, Marina Del Rey having mm -hmm. lunch and this, this woman is hanging her laundry in Italy mm -hmm. and this person is on a mm -hmm. boat in Guatemala and Lake Atitlan and all of these things are happening simultaneously. Yep. And it just, it has you feeling small and all connected at the same time. You just said it in far better ways than I could say that. And I, I've had those same moments of just being, you know, very present in whatever thing I was in and, and being uncomfortable, uh, being comfortable being uncomfortable because part of travel is um, being very comfortable with this like, oh, I don't speak the language or, oh, I can't count the money. I don't know what this converts into <laughs> or um, I don't know the customs. I'm not supposed to hug this woman because she's Muslim. Oh, wow. Sorry. I didn't. Oops. I didn't know that. Or all those things. Um, I kind of like I love resting in that in that sort of like, oh, I don't really understand these customs. Um, and yeah, the world does become smaller, but I feel so much bigger today. Mm -hmm. Because like uh, Yala Bipti, I can like right now I can tell you what's going on with my people as they're celebrating Eid tonight uh, in in Kuwait City. Uh, you know, I can tell you what's going on. Like I'm that connected to people because I also run a network where you know I'm you know my my days you know my nights end as as you know as Saudi is waking up and my days start with you know other people. We're using Clubhouse uh, that way from a time zone perspective. We're we're thinking about like when people are consuming content, what people are consuming content, are they waking up in London? Are they waking up in these cities? And so I think a lot of that has helped me sort of, especially in the pandemic, just think about being a global citizen through like a new contextual framework. Totally, totally. And I know that you're a huge supporter of the, of what you call the creative economy. And I yeah. think it's awesome to think about it that way. And, and you talk about scaling serendipity and working at the intersection of tech and culture and hustle. And I, I know you've been doing that, you know, from, from back in the nineties when you were, you know, a label exec and, and I'd love to have a sense of what it was like, you know, if you give us a snapshot of back then, you know, the golden era of nineties, hip hop and R and B and how it led you to, to where you are today. Mm. I think that pre-social media, um, I had to become really good at a few things um and and one of those was the ability to read a room to use whatever um emp empath powers i had combined with um street sense combined with um probably some black italian charm in there to really um to really understand context and understand who's in the room um before you could you know, research them on LinkedIn or, you know, so I, 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 you know, went into the record business, you know, with a full academic hat, like I'm going to figure out like how this works. 
so it started actually uh my best friend's mother is is uh dion warwick and so i kind of came to la from the bay area didn't know a ton about what the behind the curtain of hollywood looked like and through their house on sunset and elm you know i met all these famous people patty labelle and sammy davis jr and their cousin is whitney houston and so that house became a playground of like unmasking fame like you know i knew when like miss dion we go to roscoe's and like she was like having a hard day and then we get in the car and like she had to become dion you know um and um i got to see close up fame right my first tour was whitney houston tour like i'd never been on a tour before i actually went to it to it like backstage and you know and smelled like weed in the dressing room and all kinds of you know so i um i think for me i had to learn really quickly like how to work a room and then the second thing i really learned were like um systems and networks like how what fuels the record business right so most people don't know the history of the record business there was a day when fingers got broken to get records played on the radio the mafia was in control of radio promotion so i learned like all the mafia families in which families control radio promotions and which you know like i was also a mafia historian so it was like perfect combination of being a young 20 something going into the record business promising my family that i would you know i dropped out of my senior year at ucla to go in the record business but i really like networks and systems. I'm also a student of the Black Panther Party and the Oakland Black Panther Party. So I love like when systems and networks come together either for impact or for or for creators. And in the case of Black Panther Party, there's a system and a network. There was a direct a minister of culture and a minister of information. And you know, in the record business, there are radio promotions and there's street promotions and there's people that hung the posters and people that went into record stores. And so I really loved learning about the systems and how things get played, you know, how shit gets done. You know, same thing in politics, like shit gets done because people's, you know, palms are out or wheels are greased. And that's what happens in the record business. And so I learned that really early. I worked in the Sony music hierarchy. Our boss was Tommy Matola and Donnie Einer. And I got to work on all these artists that I would probably call today startup founders. And they became the Fugees and Nas and Lauren Hill and Maxwell and Destiny's Child and Beyonce, all these like things. But I, but I, I knew them when they were startup founders. And so um, that kind of idea of, um, of, of living through the 90s, understanding how to build a brand from the from the ground up happened as I got this, you know, fantastic job at, at the age of 25 at Columbia Records. And it was just a moment. It was like catching lightning in a bottle when black music, hip hop, R&B was having like a, a 90s moment and they were trying to hire really smart people. I thought that the way to get into the record business was to become an attorney. So I worked at an entertainment law firm and then I got an internship at Columbia Records. And I was like, I'm going to go do that. Like, I'm not going to become an attorney. And um yeah, I just you know, kind of wrote, wrote it out, caught a nice little wave in 95, you know, 93 to like 98 was sort of a really golden era. I'm like a West Coast kid living in New York with all this Oakland swagger and mouthpiece I got. So I'm like running through New York, you know, going to Justin's. I'll leave Justin's, you know, at a night of dinner where you're like at this table and that, you know, Puffy's at that table, a brand person's at that table, Vibe magazine's at that table. And I would work the room and leave with, you know, three deals and two job offers. And so I learned the art of the room, you know, and the art of like what happens in the rooms where things happen uh, very, very early in my career. And, um, it, 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 you know, it's afforded me, you know, this, this, appreciation for my network and um and not looking at my network as something that people say oh i'm, I'm a networker or i'm a networked but i but i truly have a network and i work that room when i need to in new york i work the room in dubai and i tell the person in dubai go see my friend in new york you know i tell my friend in stockholm to go see my people in uh you know in medellin and like that's happening all day for us so once i figured out like okay there's a real power in making connections. I never feel disconnected from what's happening in Rio because I just hooked you up with my boy in Rio. You guys are doing a deal or you invested in this company or you're doing something. I feel connectedness to the globe because part of my flywheel and my engine is actually, you know, 5% of my day is making things happen and connecting. And now we've automated it. Now we have an actual platform called the Authenticated. But in the beginning, I would say I was probably, do if you look at my call sheet, 5% of my day or 5% of my week, maybe, I don't know, was certainly dedicated to making sure that people connected. And I was what you would call in Gladwellian language, um, a connector, also a maven, 
also a salesman, I guess, but, but I certainly yeah. uh, appreciated my, my ability to be a connector. Uh, and I, I appreciate it as a, as a, not just a, a thing to do, but like a way of being. Yeah. It's a natural state for you. I can tell it's like one of, it's your superpower, it's yes. part of your essence of who you are. And then you've been able to cultivate that into your genius zone and share it again with yes. everything that you've touched, like in across the board. Yes. You know, absolutely. Like, it's where connector. I operate. That it's is. where I operate. It's where I operate in, in, in you know, I, but I've been like this since high school. I went to Palo Alto High School. So I left Oakland when I was younger. I went to Palo Alto High School. I went to a super wealthy high school, cross street from Stanford, you know, saw the birth of the internet on Stanford's campus when I was in high school. I, I was cutting class. I was like hanging out at Meyer and Green Library, playing basketball, trying to pick up girls. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I had a thriving fake ID business in high school. I had more money in my pocket then than I do now. Um, my high school was very <laughs> entrepreneurial. Um, it was a party high school. It was whose parents are out of town, which mansion and Ferrari can you drive? Um, and that's the way I grew up, you know? And so I also ben I benefit from being an El Camino Real kid, being a kid that grew up in the Vatican City of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, um, seeing the beginnings pre-Silicon Valley, it was just Palo Alto, but seeing that like, like, um, you know, I can be super smart, super nerdy into like all kinds of different things and just celebrate my curiosity, I think is, has been a, a, a consistent theme. Curiosity is huge. It will yeah. continue to bring new understanding to every day, all day, you know, being able to be a, a, a student of the world and being able to have that curiosity. Like I, I consciously will remind myself to be curious with things yes. because we can easily jump to things in our minds. Like, Oh, I know how this is going to pan out, or I yeah. know what that's going to be right. Or that person's going to say that, or they didn't say that, but they meant this. And that's all a created story. It's not even real. It doesn't even exist. Absolutely. It's just, and so to approach it from the level of curiosity and be like, Hey, curious, what is that? Right? Like, what exactly. is that? You know, which is, which is what led me to even reach out to you. It was curiosity because, right. um, you know, talk about being like a connector and global. I, um, I haven't been on clubhouse before I hadn't been, <laughs> and I had, I had signed up and it was, I was like, I don't know, two in the morning. I mean, it was like late. Right. And really? somehow like I picked up my phone, I was getting ready to go to bed mm. and I, I was in a room and, mm. and then there was music playing and I swear I've never been on it. So I was just like, oh, there's music. And I, I thought that it was a thing where it's more like a, a conference hall where you kind of like, I'm going to stand up and I'm going to teach you about X. Right. And so I thought, oh, geez, I, I, I do a lot of that. Like, maybe I don't really need that. And so the music was playing and it was you, you were DJing. And, and I was like, Oh, wow. And I have never in my life ever. I love music. My musicians in my family, all of it. I've never in my life had somebody like nail the intersection of the type of music that I love oh, wow. more than you I ever. Wow. It was like, <laughs> you know, it was like hip hop, old school, new school. It was also global connected. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it had like house and, and, and then it was just like, and new things and things that I had heard and then remixes of things and just, and reggae and just like that roots, like connection. Oh man, I was, I, I, I didn't sleep. And, and I'm like, wow, there's thousands of people on here. And there were people from the East coast and it was like four or five in the morning for them. I don't know. Maybe it was like one and it was four over there. And they were like, James, you're so good. Like, I can't go to sleep. I'm just popping around my house. <laughs> you know? I was like, I was doing the same thing. I'm lying there in the dark going, I can't turn this off. Who is this guy? You know? That's so so cool. you did that. And I, and that curiosity, like I, it prompted me to, to really reach out to you and just be like, Hey, I was so moved by it, honestly, that I was like, I have to reach out to this guy and thank God that we were able to connect, you know, that, that doesn't happen that often either. So, right. you know, that's, that's, wow, that's pretty great. amazing. Maybe is that what you're talking about when you say, um, like serendipity and being able to like scale serendipity and the creative economy, like how does one scale serendipity? And is that what happened and how we met? Heard that one before. Um, <laughs> but I think that, uh, 
you know, there's, there's that line in, in Hamilton that says, I want to be in the room where things happen. And I think a lot of what I do is making the rooms where things happen and making the moments where things happen. And I just got clear in the pandemic uh, to embrace this idea of room creation and room building and, and really world building, which is essentially what we're doing these days. Um, so we're building worlds. So you were in one of my worlds. You met, by the way, uh, my alter ego, my DJ name. Uh, I just gave it gave myself uh, yesterday for my birthday. My DJ name is DJ Rich Cacao. Um, because everybody loves chocolate. And by the way, if you book me, um, because everybody loves chocolate goes with the title. So all, all of you <laughs> who who want to book me, that's that's part of it. But uh, DJ Rich Cacao, um, sort of uh, built builds these rooms, right? And he builds these rooms because he sees himself as the sort of modern day salonier, right? The person who's like coming from the sort of salon culture of Paris or Harlem um, and um, holds intellectual dialogue and conversation. Um, and I think that's the big, that's the, that's the, that's the emergence of a new archetype that's going to come out of the pandemic. And so I'm channeling sort of Walt Disney, Hugh Hefner and Huey P. Newton kind of like in one, <laughs> like archetype me and so you i don't know where you fell in the chain but we have a show we do on clubhouse called room service i'll dj for a couple hours and then um one of the portfolio companies that we have a stake in is a company called comma and they led by an incredible founder named chloe mcintosh and she was a creative director at soho house for for uh five years she's french she's lives in london and she had an exit and she wanted to solve for sexual boredom so she created an app called comma and we do a thing called comma nights where we talk about masturbation and pleasure and all kinds of things and she just flows with vulva and penis body language it's amazing so so there's like this amazing thing we do where it's like we create a room a safe space to talk about um you know, sex and pleasure and love and how pleasure and food and pleasure and music. And I think for me, what I'm looking to do, especially coming out of the pandemic is create these, these like a metaverse, basically, like create these worlds where uh, things happen. And you might see me on, I don't know, LinkedIn. Oh, he's a venture capitalist. And yes, there are conversations we're having around NFTs and reggae and Reg C and all the stuff that I, that I know. But there's also things where you might go, wow, how did he just connect Dominican Republic and Joburg and Joburg and Jamaica. And like, I'm mm. speaking to people through the music that I'm DJing. And I think in these worlds, in these communities, um, things can happen this way, things can happen this way. Um, and so I do believe that there can be a scaling of like, oh, that was the room. That was the, you know, that was the room to be in. That was the, that's when I met this person. That's when I heard about Chloe, who's built this company called Kama. That's when I heard about these. I mean, that's kind of our, that's my theater. That's my black box theater to either tell a story or introduce you to uh, an idea, introduce you to a concept. It's sort of me creating stage um, to tell um, a perspective. I'm just one person with a perspective. Um, and I, I think the, the idea is that um, I don't really use things like Clubhouse to just promote myself. I use them so that action can happen. So a lot is going on, you know, in my DMs, There's a lot of sliding in my DMs happening. There's a lot of like texting my community numbers, like all these kind of things that are happening. And that's the mm -hmm. action. That's the like, that's when I know that like things are happening when people are responding to things I'm saying. Um, and we've been playing this sort of, you know, this, this hamster experiment, hamster wheel experiment of like, what does it mean to, to move humans in the, in the physical and digital real estate? So you're in my venue, in my room, you heard me DJing, you know, that will summer of 2022 become a place in a beach city in Barcelona that we're, you know, some friends of ours own right now, or Reykjavik, or um, or Istanbul, um, and we're already envisioning us being in these spaces and places, having conversations about, you know, um, whatever, all erogenous zone of, of a city, right? Um, so yeah, so I think for me, uh, this pandemic has been sort of like Sim City a little bit. I've been like building worlds um, in both 
phys in virtual that are meant to be transferred to physical and so that we can live in what I'm, I'm referring to as hybrid one, which is June to September and hybrid two, which is September to June, that we can live in those worlds in the new modern versions of our connected selves. Yeah, as a social experiment or social scientist, I'll tell you just from over here, when I was listening to that, what occurred to me was, oh, okay, whenever he's doing this live, I'm going to be there. Like whenever I can physically go and dance and have yes. all the people that are yes. dancing together. Yeah. Like that was what occurred to me. And I was like, and then I looked it up and I'm like, oh good, he's in LA. So that means that we'll probably right. have some events here. Totally. So I don't June. have to, you know, fly away and leave my three year old son yet. You don't but have I'm to. like, <laughs> I'm like, dude, where, whenever he's playing, I told my, my friends. So this was all happening and occurring over here. Oh wow. Even before we connected, I told, yeah. you know, my best friend who's, who lives 10 minutes away, she's in Manhattan beach. I was just like, Hey, Britt, dude, whenever he's going, we're going like yeah. he hit our, he hit our sound and the intersection of it. And I just want to go and dance, you know, because right. we've all been Perfect. home, exactly. you know, like, and go, and, go and dance here. and then, and then maybe hear like a really dope perspective from, like, I want to mix yeah. sort of, um, right. I, I've been doing these things called Jeffersonian dinners. I did, I did a hundred of them last year. Um, wow. I learned the Jeffersonian dinner gathering. So I was doing a lot of this pre pandemic. So sure. I was known for my dinners at Soho House Malibu. I was known for like the things we did in this tour called Culture and Code. So a lot of this is like, it was a little ahead of its time. And now coming out of the pandemic, it's never been a better time to build community, to build gathering, to build experience. It's gonna be, and so to your point, we're, do, we're already launching in June with a partnership with Soho House. Uh, we're turning LA into something we're calling Creator City. We're, we're burrowing this, this place out so that South Bay, West Side, Midtown, DT, LA, you know, we're kind of doing a different event, you know, different days. We're already thinking through what life post pandemic. I'm already on to summer 2022. I'm already, I believe it's coming out of this thing. It becomes the Harlem Renaissance meets the Roaring Twenties meets the summer of love of 69. And there's going to be more creators that create all these beautiful uh, constructs with, you know, the ability to finance it through NFTs, the ability to like share equitably across their cap tables. And I believe that like the idea economy is going to, is going to come together in, in these really interesting ways. And there's going to be more sex, lots of sex. And that's the summer of love. Season, but. <laughs> Sounds great. <Yeah>. I'm in. <laughs> um, so what about then if you're talking about there's the authenticated that you've created, if, yeah. if I could call it like a social network, right? And then there's also authenticated ventures, which is the way that I'm seeing it is more like this big kind of brand studio and investment advisory. Then you're working to like accelerate growth inside of that. And then there's the membership side of it that's for like bosses and founders and funders. And, and it's like diverse across everywhere. Um, it did, did I like Pick that up, Great right? Great job. No, you've, you've well researched me. Um, yeah, so we, uh, well, we just took on a new, um, I guess it's the first time I'm kind of saying this, but we just took on a new uh, investor partner. Um, so the Authenticated Ventures is now in a joint venture with an, an incredible new business partner. So our business is in sort of two places. One is, um, yeah, like an accelerator kind of, you know, format. If you took a, an accelerator and a co-op and kind of put them together um, with this overarching idea of the creator economy and that, that being in creator mode is, is a thing. Um, and creator mode for us is open source for everyone. I worked on Nike when I owned my, my agency. One of the lines that Bowerman, uh, the, the famed coach who taught uh, Phil Knight, um, says is if you have a body, then you're an athlete. And so we believe if you have a body, then you're a creator and the creator mode lives within everybody, whether you're, um, you could be, you know, your business could be, you know, in, in, in accounting, it could be, you know, we believe there's a, there's a creator in there. And, and for us, creator just means somebody who's using these new platforms to build their business on top of, and there takes a level of ingenuity and creativity to kind of stitch together. You know, what I gave you was my railroad tracks. Yours may look very different, but I have, you know, a CRM system. I have a way of selling. I have products I sell. I have things I sell. Uh, but my store might be look slightly different.
different, but all of us are bo are bound together by this idea that that it, there's never been a greater time to build on these tech tools. There's mm -hmm. never been more resources to actually build your business, right? And so, um, so the creator economy is our grand kind of thesis that governs the the strategic work that we do. Kind of our mm -hmm. we call it a brand studio. It's more of like a strategic shop. Think IDEO or X Labs, uh, Google X, um, mm -hmm. and then. Um, we're probably a month into like uh, new, you know, new, new, uh, new capital that's flown into that business. And so we've made three or four significant hires. We have a former McKinsey uh, uh, amazing woman who was building a magazine for me. That's she was a member of the authenticated, which is my community. A lot of my opportunities, talent, everything kind of flows through that. Um, I would mm. say the authenticated is probably closer to my own version of a more diverse Soho house. Um, so it's like, you know, people who are kind of come together, uh, bound by kind of, you know, uh, interesting backgrounds, diverse backgrounds. Um, some people are famous, some people you've never heard of. And we built it in Slack and WhatsApp about four years ago. And uh, so that's kind of where, you know, where a lot of things flow. People become members of it. We do events. We did, you know, a, a hundred dinners uh, in the pandemic. We did, you know, four major summits last year as a part of the Authenticated. And so okay. Authentic Authenticated Ventures operates it with, with two arms. One is the strategic work and the other, which was investment advisory, is now actually us making investments. So we've invested oh. probably in about three different companies, uh, Clubhouse being one of them. And uh, yeah, we're nice. you know on our way to an early stage, uh, formal seed stage kind of fund by the end of the year, hopefully, fingers crossed, inshallah. Um, but uh, yeah, we uh, we we are certainly um, a very uh, like a like a, a modern day Disney is. We have a former Disney person on our team, and mm -hmm. she and she likes to say that we're kind of building this open source modern Disney. We're world building in the same way Epcot uses Epcot to kind of world build and test for brands and for partners. We're doing that kind of world building in our own metaverse. Um, and uh, it's a lab, it's a lab of hopefully spinning up lots of businesses, not just one, but mm -hmm. we believe that coming through our accelerator, uh, having access to our, our, our network, having access to our capital, having ex uh, uh, access to this incredible network allows us to help people spin up businesses and ideas uh, faster. So that's kind of the, that's the flywheel of how things, then mm. our partner has a traditional agency. So he's, the agency is called Quantacy. There are 70 employees um, and they work with, you know, Wells Fargo, Honda, Google, Spotify, uh, based in downtown LA in the arts district. So we're really excited about this new partnership. It gives us a foothold in, 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 the, in the new emerging, what we think is the creative district, creator district in, in LA, which yeah. is, which is the, uh, which is what's happening in the arts district uh, with you know Spotify, Warner Brothers, uh, us there as well. We were we were there early, um, so we're really excited about what's going on in downtown LA. And um, and then uh, yeah, the investment side, like I said, we're we're you know I feel like I've been in about four years of venture capital school. Uh, venture capital school. I've produced family office events. I've, you know, done some advisory work with startups. Um, and then we, you know, recently got a great allocation to invest in, in Clubhouse, which was a platform not only did I just had read about, but had amassed 2.2 million followers and, you know, and, and, and wow. understood the guts of, right. It wasn't just like, I don't, we don't just yeah. invest in things that we think are hype. We're investing in things that we think we can contribute to and actually pour gas on and accelerate the growth around. Exactly. Yeah. That was my next question is like, what is it that you, like, what are the factors that have you investing in, in companies? Cause as you said, some of them are known, some of them are not, you know, what is it for our listeners uh, and just something to strive for in terms of what it is that you're looking to create with, with everything that you're doing. And congratulations, by the way, it's just, it's amazing what a visionary and what a vision you have and that you're creating it. Right. So, yeah. I think for us criteria, you know, there's some certain intangibles, I mean, this non-negotiables, right? The business has to be led by a founding team that's smart and really gets it, that they, you know, it's not just an idea, it's a business. Um, so once you get those things out of the way, we're generally playing. <laughs> just that. <laughs> we're generally playing. I mean, because I just uh, there are people who come to us all the time for like I'm like that, that's not a business, that's an idea, or that's a hobby, right? So there's got to be some you know skin in the game. Got to be kind of far enough along where it's like it's investable. We're you know we don't have a ton of capital to invest right now, so we can't be risky with our capital right now. Um, and then I'd say it's it's also businesses where we think that our contributions uh, uh, and our expertise 
is, are valuable. Um, we don't like to lead, you know, we have celebrity relationships. What I don't want to be is the person who can bring celebrities to the table. So generally when people call us and go, oh, we want you on our cap table because you're friends with Ludacris. And I'm like, no, but like you want me on your cap table because I know earned, paid, owned media. I know data, <laughs> you know, but most people don't right. understand that about us. So I think it's understanding yeah. both of those things, understanding we understand culture and we understand go to market, how you launch something. And we understand talent and, and the new creator economy. Because really when you're talking about celebrities for us, I just interpret that as, you know, what do the new creators look like? And how do you partner with creators in a way that's enriching and that actually drives business? And so I think when you put those things together, that's the high level criteria. It's manifesting in a, you know, in a pet business that we're going to, um, you know, invest in. It's a, like a, a robotics kind of product play in the pet space and we think you know my partners worked with uh bainfield far uh, bainfield uh which is a pet hospital you know and, and worked with yeah. mars for years so anyway we think we have some some we're never going to be the biggest check on the cap table but we think that we can be the most valuable and most you know strategic uh, uh pe person on your cap table and i love that you talk about enriching because that's a really important component is if what it is that you're creating is actually enriching the lives of others and being able to bring people together and and add massive value and not just because it's cool or you know cuz culture can kind of get into a whole other world of like you know the influencer model and the who looks best and and you know it's like well but what is it that's going on that's actually going to be creating something that's going to enrich other people's lives yeah. and enhanced our lives in so many ways. And I, and I think it's a really fine line. I think for us, culture equals where people are paying attention. It's less about TikTok houses and sneakers and fast cars. It's really there. It, the culture to me is a much broader interpretation of culture, but I agree in the limited version of what people generally think of when they think of culture and the limited purview of which they look at my LinkedIn profile and go, oh, you worked in fashion, you worked in music, you worked in, so you define culture as this. No, I define culture as um, lots of different things, right? Lots of different things. So um, yeah, I think for us, it is where do we, where does one plus one equal three and four? Where do we think we can actually really add some value in, in what you're doing? And, and so therefore the projects we're working on right now, especially in the lab, go from the White House to housing for African-Americans, to a major media publication that wants to revive itself, to an NBA player who's retired and bought something and wants to think about how do I think about investing in cities differently? It's, a, it's, in, it, it's intentionally wide because we have solves and solutions across different worlds. And it makes totally makes sense for us internally, um, but it's not, you know, we're not there to like increase anybody's um, uh, profile or make anybody any more famous. It's really more about like, what does true influence look like? What is true understanding culture signals, which is something we talk a lot about. What is understanding? It's like you could have data and then you have, you have insights. Like I ran a business, my social media agency was building social media command centers in 2010. So I would like scrape data and drive traffic for major TV shows. But it was also like, what is it about what they're saying about the show Blackish, And why are they talking about the Grammys this way? And like understanding, interpreting the data in real time, by the way, um, wow. and, and being able to serve those insights up. Um, I think that's what sort of has trained me to be this sort of like cultural anthropologist is I understand like how to use social data. I understand how to read the streets, read the tea leaves, but it's actually no different than my days of hip hop. Like in the days of hip hop, <laughs> like we use things called BDS and sound scan. So like, oh, the record's reacting at WPGC. Oh, KMEL played the records. So that must mean the Bay Area is hot on the record. Oh, so I need to go test that hypothesis that the Bay Area really cares about this artist. Oh, let me set up a club date in San Jose because I think like more Latinos are into this artist than uh, the Filipinos in Daly City. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but like we were always playing around. That's why I call hip hop the original lean startup, right? We took a rough idea, put it on a mixtape, threw it out to the streets, and we iterated or pivoted based on what people came back with. We, the mixtape was the original minimal viable product. Um, <laughs> I, I once took these uh, executives on a tour in, in Atlanta, and, I, and literally we went from the studio to understand how records go from the strip, it goes from the studio to the strip club 
and the strip club is literally in Atlanta, a testing ground for records. Like we knew oh. whether records were going to work because you would bring the white, the white test pressings to the strip club DJs. The strip club DJs are the ones who are looking for fail fast <laughs> methodology. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if the idea of, middle, of lean startup is fail fast, this record ain't working. And, 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 you know, hey, to just be, this is the way that I, this was my Harvard business school, you know, wow. in the nineties, you know, it's yeah. like understanding consumer audience reaction and how did it make you feel? Yes. Yes. I have many a mixtape that I've made. I have my, I have my pink, like full on open it up cassettes. And it's like Lizzie mix one through Lizzie Ooh. mix 35, yes. like from all the way back. Lizzie mix. <laughs> DJ Lizzie, Lizzie mix. mix. Oh my God. I know. So funny. And we have a, we have a record player in the back that still has, you know, the cassette. So nice. I'll just, I'll just be back there. My husband has a studio and he, nice. you know, he's an incredible musician and composer and well, I'll just put it on and I'll just nice. like clean up and do yep. things. I'm like, Oh man, like the songs. And it like brings you back and it puts you in this, in this like time capsule back yeah. to where you were back in the day. Right. And you, you it, it's like visceral, it, it, it's real, it's incredible. It was my love Mixed language, tapes. it's how I got girls. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I can speak in the language of, you know, of music, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's an encoded language. Yeah, it is encoded. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, it's artful. It's creative. It, it yeah. brings back that curiosity, like we talked about, you know, and discovery because you're yeah. discovering something, you're learning something and, um, and, you know, being a student and being someone yeah. that's always reading and always learning and always yeah. picking up and putting together. And, and again, with the connector piece, because you're connecting yeah. things. So it's not like, yeah, okay, this whole album is amazing, but like this song, and then you put it with this song and then you put it there, it creates a whole nother environment. And well, energy. one of my secret uh, weapons is like, I'll play like a really a, a hip hop song, you know, and then I'll take you to like the French, like pop record that they sampled. And you'll see that that French pop record is beautiful. You're like, oh, wow. I never knew Charles Osnavour, like was this amazing composer and artist. And like, you know, and I, I so I, I, I used to manage DJ Jazzy Jeff. He's my best friend. And so um, the thing about Jeff is, his entire studio is filled with the sickest vinyl collection. And sometimes people would just come to the studio, like Jewel came and hung out with us for like three days one time. And like Herbie Hancock pulled up to the studio. Everyone used to come to Philly to get a sound, but sometimes they would just sit with Jeff just to like, we would just play records. So we, we, we would create color, we create context. I think like a music producer, like the way that I do business is like a music producer because I'm trained coming from that business. So like color, uh, sound, music creates, mm -hmm. uh, it unlocks the imagination for me. And I think that's part of what we're doing. You know, we're building an imagineering studio for people. We are for the White House right now, their imagination unit. I just got off a call with my team and like we have a, an assignment we're working on with the White House. I was like, this is an imagination project. We've got to be imaginers for President Biden, you know, right now. We have to help him think differently about how to communicate this specific thing that we're working on. So I think music is my unlock for that imagination. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's an incredible opportunity to be able to translate and share through all the knowledge that you've picked up and just through your natural talent, you know, being able to do that and and give back. Um it's pretty miraculous. I know that uh, we were, I heard you talking in another interview saying uh, about how your legacy that you want to leave behind and how you want to leave it all on the court. And I hear in your communication and everything that you're sharing with us today, like that you're doing that, like you're playing all out, you're playing to win, you're sharing, you're making an impact. You are on so many levels, like bringing it right. Like bringing all of you and, and like, what is it that drives that for you? Like being able to give it, give it all away. Cause a lot of people, they like to kind of keep it right here, you know, and they're not just like generously being like, Hey, let's create this for a world that's better than we could ever imagine, you know, for our children and for our children's children. And, and like, I really get that in how you are in your way of being. So like, what drives you to do that? I want to die empty. I want to die availing myself of all of these ideas, these people, these connections. I mean, like I've, I've made money, I've lost money. My family's made money, lost money. Like I'm already past the money making thing. I, I, I am super successful uh, by all standards of any um, 
metric that one would, would measure success. I'm here having this conversation as a black man in America who ducked from bullets when he was young because I lived in LA and police used to jack us. And then yes, and you'd have to know when they were crip walking, that's when you need to leave the party. You know what I mean? So I, I mean, just every day that I'm here and evaded all of the things that could happen, you know, in this country to me, I'm already winning. You know what I mean? So, and two, just like I'm immigrant hustle. You know what I mean? Like my, my grandfather came to this country, fought for the U S army, spoke five languages, you know, my, on my dad's side of the family, you know, I'm learning more about that side. I didn't grow up with my father, but, you know, learning a lot about my Bahamian roots and, you know, connected to Miami and all the Bahamians that built Miami. So like, I feel like when you understand where you come from, it just, you play a totally different game. And then like, I just, I have like, I've, I've been successful in various seasons of my life. So I'm not chasing, I've been on the wall street journal. I used to appear on CNN. Like I've done all the things that people are like, Oh, I want to achieve that. I've done it. It's great. It's awesome. It's not, you know, I, I, and I feel like I want to literally avail myself, die with a legacy. I've had friends commit suicide. I've had mentors pass away. Um, you know, and I just think a lot these days about legacy and what that really means and what it means to, you know, to, I think one of the things I always say is that, you know, you can leave your kids money or you can leave them a network, you know, so that you're like, oh, your dad was James Andrews or like you're James Andrews daughter. You know I mean? That's like a tremendous thing that I think about a lot. Uh, just that idea of leaving and passing along. And then I've recently become friends with like Royals. It's super fun to have Royals as friends. I have two of them. I'm now like in my second princess. Um, and like, it's, am <laughs> it's amazing. Like when you, I like force them to talk about their grandfather, or their dad. I'm like, tell me like, what's your, your dad? Like, what is it? You know? And um, I think that there is something about, you know, being a king, right. Being and understanding, you know, understanding, you know, um, what it means to think like a, like a, they think differently, you know what I mean? When you're regal. Mm. And um, I think that's what I've kind of started to own the last five years. Now that I have all these fancy Royal friends is just mm. like, what does it mean to think like a Royal? You know what I mean? And how do you govern yourself and your family and your opportunities in the same way a king would? And um, that's been a really fun, fun bonus pack for me lately. That's a cool way to think about it. I've never thought of it like that. Yeah. 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 And the history and the legacy and then all the generations that have come and will Absolutely. continue to be created. Continue yeah. To be created. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, we're building a magazine right now. That's kind of like meant to kind of document this time, this moment. Um, we think a lot, you've probably heard me say this maybe in, in interviews and this idea of reframing time and money and relationships. And for us time, you know, the Greeks used to measure time two ways. One is chronos, uh, which is where we get the word chronology. But the second is kairos. And that's a word that's really shaped uh, a lot of the stuff that we're doing at the authenticated. Kairos is a measurement of time around seasons. So spirituality so It's not a clock or a calendar. It's actually, you can look back on your life and go, that was a kairos moment. So hmm. we like to say at the authenticated, we live chirotically because we're playing with time. I even like on Mondays, I think that, and it's connected to the imagination. The people who live the most chirotically are our children. Children don't care about your bedtime. They don't care about what, you know, they're going to play with, with what they're going to play with. So I've actually instituted living chirotically. So on Mondays, I play. I literally yeah. try to tap into my chirotic nerve. I made that, I made that up a little bit. Um, but on Mondays, <laughs> I block my calendar where I go maybe find records or go, I, I literally intentionally go play. Um, the other thing is I did is most people were like getting prepared for their year, right? January 1st to 5th. I made my January 1st, February 15th this year. And so I spent the first six weeks just like doing what I need to do. And then February 15th was my January one. So I'm always like playing with time yeah. because, because it's a, it's a resource. But, but the, if you look at the way the Greeks measure it, go study Kairos. There is something spiritual about how we think about time as a resource. The same thing can apply to money. We're in a big study right now in the authenticated around the relationship between spirituality and money, whether I have a, a friend who's a, a princess or a crown prince, or that I have a friend that grew up in the projects in Watts, there's still these things and these barriers around our relationship to money uh, that I'm really starting to dig into, right? Which is like, oh, maybe the way your mom or your dad talked about money, the way they spent money, the way they, 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 they raised you around money, and there never fails. There's like, everybody has a trauma story, 
whether mm-hmm. you grew up with a silver spoon or not. And I think that that's another thing that we're starting to unpack, you know, and obviously the relationship stuff I talked about ad nauseum. But when you put those together, that's, that's, that's my legacy is to be able to like take some of these, these life learnings and, and give them away. Um, super appreciative. I've worked with Jane Fonda. You know, I remember Jane used to say, you know, uh, I'm on a learning safari and we kind of just went on this learning safari together for a couple of years. I taught her how to, you know, use the internet, built her first website in 2008. And I was really struck by how this woman who's a legend, right, allowed me to see the 13 year old Jane Fonda and allowed me to see kind of who she really wanted to become. And uh, I just think I'm a big believer in like really understand that what you're playing for is a long game. You know what I mean? And um, sometimes when you're in it, it's hard to see it. But like, if you just consistently this year, I was very consistent, consistently consistent, you know, with like, okay, this is who I am. And this is what I'm and, and if there were five people that showed up in my clubhouse room, fine. If there were 50 people that showed up, great, you know, and, um, and yeah, and then we consistently built this audience. And now I'm like, okay, now I have 2 million followers. How do I what do I do with 2 million followers? I want to go deeper in the globe. I want to produce content that, for this part of the world. So we did a whole thing on the, on the creative economy in the Gulf region. And we have creatives from Kuwait and Saudi and all these places because I personally have never been to those cities in the Gulf. And so I'm using what I have. If it's 2 million followers, if it's whatever I have access to, uh, to, to build my little kingdom and my little world. And I think at the end of it, when it's all said and done, I want to just make this little Roblox Lego thing. And I want to be able to like hand this off. I always tell my kids, if anything ever happens to me, all the ideas are in my moleskins. Every quarter I have a new moleskin with a, with a saying on the front, all of my visions, all of my plans are Love all it. in, in the, in the, in the moleskin. And um, yeah, I, I think, uh, I think uh, I want to leave that behind as, as a part of my legacy. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. And, and I'm with you on the timing thing. I, your Monday is my Tuesday. I do the yeah. same thing on Tuesdays. Right. It's, yeah. it's my family time. It's our creative time. And, and I always say, what do we want to create today? Because we could do whatever we want. And it, exactly. I mean, it happens to be the day that my husband isn't on the stage and he's not out in the world performing. And so yeah. that's why it's a Tuesday for us, um, just logistically. But it's like, that's the day. And I, I tell people, I'm like, don't bother me on a Tuesday. Yep. And, and I know myself too, cause I'll have clients and people that'll want to work and I'll like, I might offer it up and I'm like, don't let me like, just right. stop me because I will like, right. if I, if I get pulled for it, but yeah. you know, like this, this That's last it. Tuesday, we, we drove up, we bent time. We went to um, desert hot springs and we took like one day nice. and it just, and you just came right back in and yep. boom, you know, exactly. and that's how we can play you know, it's with living our abundantly. It's living yes. abundantly. You're living, you're yes. not living from lack. You're not, Oh my God, I, gotta, I need, I need the Tuesday. I got to, You know, no, you can live no. abundantly and time is an, you know, time is, I mean, it's not, it's an abundant resource depending on how you look at it. I look at it as abundant. I look at it as like, we have, we have as much time as we want to commit to. We, we can stretch time. We can, yes. we can, we can, we can think about it as a season, you know, even when you're in the season, that's hard, you know, it's gonna, you're going to come out of that season. You know, you're going to look back on that and go, ah, I remember that season. And that, how did you use your time during that season? What did you do? What did you sink into? What did you, what, who did you give to? Who did you pour into? Who, who took from you, you know? Mm-hmm. I can go mm-hmm. on. It's a whole other. Interview. I know we can, we can just, go I, I can do a whole thing on that. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe next time we'll have you back okay. and we'll talk about that. Let's go. Um, so what can people do? How can people get a hold of you? What's the best way to, to stay connected? Uh, I have the appearance of being accessible, but, uh, no, you can, <laughs> you can, uh, text me 415-843-8100. Um, you can certainly follow me, uh, at key influencer across most socials, Instagram, Twitter, um clubhouse i guess now i can add that to um uh linkedin i mean you know if you can't find me you're not really working hard enough and then we have <laughs> yeah i mean you know then there's you know i i we try to create enough touch points where i can connect with people um we have a little bit of a process of how we vet ideas i mean our business is a bit of an opportunity zone as you can well imagine you know there's a lot of sliding in dms there's a lot of coming in linkedin there's a lot of a lot of a lot, um, but uh, it, whether people are sending me records or business ideas, like, yo, wow. play this record, <laughs> you, know, this, you know, and so it's, it's a funny kind of thing to be now utilizing music, but yeah, I'm easy to read. I mean, easy how do fun. you do that? How the heck do you balance all of that? I don't even understand. I mean, unless you have a team of like a hundred that are just like handling all your things, I, I don't know how you even do that. 
Some of it is. It's, it's amazing. You're bending I, time. Yeah, I'm bending time. <laughs> bending time. Do That's, you sleep? <laughs> that is a question. No, I do. I, you know, it's funny. I, I actually, I'm, I'm 10 p.m. to bed for the most part, unless I'm DJing that night. Uh, we do do a late night show on Sunday nights, common nights and, and room service. Where, you know, I said we talk about pleasure and sex. That starts at like eight o'clock and can go to one o'clock in the morning. But I'm on, I'm in wow. bed 10. I'm up at five, six in the morning. Um, I live on the beach in L.A. So like I like to, you know, um, see the, the, the ocean, you know, and, and, and that's yeah, important to me. That helps. That yeah. Helps. Yeah. So. Man, I don't know. It's all coming together. Still, still figuring it out. It's totally open for new intros, new people. I didn't want to come off like non approachable. I, I think that I'm the person on the airplane that you're like, oh, I meet everybody on the airplanes, right? I'm like Mr. <laughs> airplane meter guy. Um, and uh, <laughs> me too. So, this is my that. LAX now. So, now it's like, so that's great meeting people. You know, Clubhouse is sort of my LAX Delta Sky Lounge now. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I know it. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm so grateful that you spent your precious time with us and it's so great to just drop in and connect with you and, and really, um, hear about the vision and the legacy that you're leaving behind and the impact that you're making in the world. And I just, I so appreciate you and, and I'm really grateful to, to start, you know, from here and see what else we can create in the world so we can make a big impact. Oh, thank you for reaching out. Thank you for, um, having me on your show and, and it, it's an honor to be uh, in your podcast world and, and whatever I can do to support your business and support your visions and dreams. I'm, I'm happy to know you and get connected and keep you in our orbit. Amen. Right on. Great. Well, thank you so much. And this is Elizabeth Upton signing off and reminding you to mind your own business. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope that you got a lot out of what we talked about today. If you are watching from YouTube, then please give the video a big thumbs up if you did. Make sure to hit subscribe down below if you haven't already and turn on the notification bell so you never miss an episode. If you are listening from Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts, because we know that there's a lot, please take a minute to subscribe if you haven't and give us a review. It helps others to find the show and it puts wind in our sails, literally. So please, please do that. We are at MYOB podcast on Instagram and I am at Elizabeth Upton coaching on Instagram. If you are interested in following along there, we offer a lot of bonus material and there is a link to the show notes down below in the description box, along with the resources we discussed in today's episode. Most of all, thank you for honoring yourself. Thank you for investing your time with us today. No one is going to be more of a champion for your growth than you are. So always remember that keep showing up and this is Elizabeth Upton signing off and reminding you to always mind your own business. <laughs>